design something that can predict the Netflix watch time for a particular TV show or movie for a specific user. Okay, thanks so much for being here again today, Nathan. Uh, can you uh, introduce yourself for our viewers? Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Nathan. I'm a fifth year PhD student at the University of Toronto and MIT. Awesome. Okay, so you have so much like in-depth knowledge of like all of the nitty gritty of machine learning to share with us. So I'm really excited to hear about that today. Um, yeah, so let's get into our question. So the question today is, um, the goal for our system uh, is to design something that can predict the Netflix watch time for a particular TV show or movie for a specific user. And ideally, we want our system to be customizable and accurate so that it can drive recommendations for both new and long-time users. How would you approach this? Yeah, I guess to, to start, uh, there's there's a few kind of clarifying questions that I'd want to ask. Um, like, I think the main question is kind of like, how much data do we have um, kind of to, to, to be able to train a system on? So you're going to assume that you have access to a sample of tens of millions of data points from a representative sample pool of the users. Okay, so so a fairly, like a very, very large sample size. So we really don't have yeah, to be worrying exactly. too much about kind of, um, kind of data scarcity. Um, mm -hmm. The second question, I guess, is, is kind of around data anonymization. Um, since a lot of these systems, you know, um, we want to, to be able to use user-specific information to be able to guide, drive these kind of recommendations. Um, what kind of information do we have access to from the users and, and can we, can we um, assume that we have access to associate different kinds of watch time logs mm -hmm. between users. Yeah, so you can assume that you have access to basic demographic information for uh, most users and that they consented to sharing their data with the company. Um, so that means that you can uh, find data from the same user and like combine it across different tables. Okay, great. Yeah, so I think in general, we, we can kind of split the features into two groups. So I think on one hand, we have kind of like user features. This is like, like you mentioned before, any of the the anonymized or de-anonymized information that we have on users, such as demographic information, you know, where they live, um, uh, what kind of person they are, if they've shared that with us. Um, we also have information like their user profile and ID so that we can combine information across um, watch time uh, logs. We might include things like past interactions or kind of profiles that they, they share a family with, for example. Um, on the other side, we have kind of movie and show features. Um, these are these would be things like uh, the genre of a movie, uh, what actors are in it, uh, how long it is, um, how many seasons a show is, how deep it is in the season, how long the, the episode is, kind of popularity with other users. Um, uh, do we, do we have access to to when the data was collected? Um, yeah, you can assume that that's available to you. Okay, great. So so I guess uh, separate from these, then we would also have kind of. Uh, features that are specific to when uh, each kind of data entry was logged. So this would be like time and date, um, what was mm -hmm. happening in the session previously. Um, I think time time and date is kind of an important feature because we know that uh, around different kinds of different parts of the season, people watch different kinds of shows um, and even during different parts of the day and different parts of the week. Um, and so these are all kind of um, a lot of important features that I would use in, in the model. Okay. So because these features come from different sources, can you discuss how you would represent each of them and also the trade-offs that come with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think most of these features are, are going to be kind of one hot feature. So like uh, genre, um, whether an actor is present, um, a lot of them are going to be kind of things where we just want to indicate whether something is or isn't present. Um, and so most of these we would featureize by using one hot vectors. Um, obviously this is great because the, the model can learn to correlate the existence of specific things since we're giving each, uh, each, each feature its own dimension. Um, but of course, this also means that the model might, might be able to overfit to specific, uh, the presence of specific features. Uh, and since, since a lot of these features kind of, you know, there's many tens of thousands of actors that are present in any, uh, show on Netflix or are, that are present in shows on Netflix, um, uh, the, the size of our feature vector might kind of increase um, to a very large size. Okay, perfect. So it sounds like you've decided in general on the relevant features that you want to train on and also how to turn them into training examples. Uh, so then the next question would be, what kind of system are you planning on training your watch time prediction model? Um, and you should remember that this model should be able to handle both new users and long time users. 
Yeah, so I guess the, the simplest method here would, would simply be to, to train um, just a single model on all the data that we have. So this would be just a model that takes in all the features that we have and, and simply predicts the watch time. Um, this is good because this allows us to, to aggregate our information across all the different uh, you know, demographic groups that we have. Um, but of course, it, it means that we're kind of sacrificing performance potentially on um, smaller demographic groups. Um, for example, people from less populous countries um, for, for the sake of kind of getting a better average prediction. Um, and this, this could be the case even for, even if we have a large sample of data, um, because we're, we're kind of uh, trying to optimize the, the loss on, on everything at once. And so we might want to train uh, specific models on smaller subgroups, um, which, which could potentially increase our performance, but also uh, risks overfitting, especially once we get kind of down to, to very small groups. Um, I think the issue of, of getting uh, user-specific recommendations is especially difficult here because um, we want to be able to train uh, some kind of model on um, a user's interactions, which may not be very large of a data set. Um, so we might learn kind of a very simple regression model that we fit on top of our global model that simply learns the residual or you know, if, if our global model learns to predict some kind of mean watch time, then, then our residual model tries to predict um, how much we, we differ from the mean. Um, but of course, with, with very few interactions, this, this supervised model is going to be um, relatively inaccurate. Okay, so it seems like you've mentioned that a lot of the issues here have to do with um, possibly overfitting, especially when there's uh, not a lot of data available, and also the requirement that you need to be able to build like personalized uh, embeddings and profiles for uh, the users and the items. So can you think of a way to actually leverage the huge amount of data that you have in like maybe an unsupervised way to try to resolve some of these problems? Yeah, I guess the simplest way here um, would, would be to, you know, before we, we were looking at featureizing data by, uh, you know, building explicit feature vectors, but uh, maybe what we want is some kind of um, representation where we we simply measure similarity between representations. So we want to have some some embedding space where, um, for for certain users, we uh, we might say that um, we might want to predict watch time by having some weighted sum of the watch time for other users. So, uh, say for for a user like me, we might try to find other users that have profiles similar to mine. Um, that have watched, you know, whatever item we want to predict on. And we might say that, you know, um, the prediction for, for my watch time for this item must be some weighted combination or, or a very similar combination to what the other users have watched. Um, and so this is kind of a, an unsupervised way to, to learn this kind of embedding and learn a prediction model since we're not actually directly training the model to predict watch time. We're simply uh, embedding the information and then learning some similarity metric. Okay, so you mentioned then uh, building uh, like basically embeddings that you can measure similarity over. How would you go about doing that? Yeah, so so I think here um, we're gonna want to have some really large matrix. Um, at least kind of the most simple approach is to have some. Uh, if we have n users and m items, then we'll have a large n by m matrix, um, where we we kind of fill in items based on whether. Uh, a user has interacted with an item. Um, and we can use different kind of uh, interaction information. For example, uh, I think the simplest way is simply to have a, you know, a, a, an entry i, j will be one if the user i has watched item j. For example, if I've watched the Star Wars movie, then the entry there would be a one. And if I haven't, then it would be a zero. Um, and, and we can use this for any kind of um, interaction that we want. For example, in this case, we might want the value to be a watch time. So uh, if I've watched, you know, two minutes of Star Wars, then the value would be two minutes. And if I've watched one minute of something else, then the value would be one minute. Okay. Uh, so then it sounds like this matrix is basically like its dimensions are the number of users by the number of items, right? Which can be pretty large. Uh, how do you anticipate being able to store this? Yeah, I think with this with this one, I think um, storage is kind of the main issue that we're, we're going to run into. Um, I think there's a few ways that we can work around this. One is that we we know that the matrix is going to be very sparse, right? Uh, with the millions and millions of items on Netflix, there's no way uh, the majority of users are going to watch um, uh, even a small percentage of them. And so 
um, it, it's even though we, uh, you know, the full matrix is n by m, we really only need to store a few entries per user. Um, and we might even be able to, for example, shard the data since we know that, you know, users, uh, the most similar users to a given user should lie kind of in similar, similar demographic regions or similar, you know, um, geographic regions. Uh, and so, um, when we when we do this similarity search, we don't necessarily have to do it over the entirety of the user base, which could be many millions and billions of users. Um, we kind of can can start small and kind of increase um, increase our scope as as we desire more and more accurate predictions of watch time. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. And so once you've been able to construct and then store these matrices, how are you then going to actually compute similarity across the representations? Right, so I think there's there's a, a lot of different similarity metrics we can use. Um, I think a, a first kind of maybe naive approach might be to simply use uh, Euclidean distance between these vectors. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, I think this this doesn't quite work here because it it really prioritizes users with with fewer items, since um, the only time we incur any kind of uh, distance between vectors is when there's a non-zero item. Um, and so um, another similar one that works might be something like Jacquard distance. So Jacquard distance, yes. which measures kind of the size of the uh, intersection set and divides by the size of the union set. So this is kind of uh, the relative size of the items that two users share. So if two users have watched almost all the same items, then they would be, this distance would be uh, close to one. And if two users have watched kind of disjoint items, then this would be close to zero. Um, there's also cosine similarity which measures kind of the, the cosine distance in embedding space between two users. Um, the nice thing about this one is that, is that it kind of measures distance in um, in, in space. So, so it's directional. Negative one is maximally um, dissimilar and one is maximally similar. Um, and I think another one that we might be able to use is Pearson correlation. So the Pearson correlation uh, measures how, how similar two vectors vary together, um, how much of the variance is explained. By each one, um, so so I think these are these are a, a few a few of the metrics that we we might want to use here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, do any of them have like certain assumptions? Like, for example, does it assume that maybe there's a linear relationship? Um, yeah, I guess uh, Pearson correlation uh, assumes kind of a linear relationship between the items. Um, Jacquard distance really works only for binary valued items since we're measuring. Right. Um, intersection over union. Um, cosine similarity works for both, um, mm -hmm. but tends to throw away um, some of the the uh, directional information uh, since we're normalizing the vectors to, to unit distance. You mean the magnitude information? Right, right, the magnitude information. Yeah. Okay, cool. So uh, given all of these considerations then, uh, for this specific problem, uh, watch time prediction, which of those uh, similarity metrics do you think is the most appropriate? I think for, for the specific problem of watch time prediction, um, I would probably use Pearson correlation. Uh, I think mm -hmm. um, because the information we're kind of wanting to measure similarity in and uh, wanting to predict in general is kind of continuous value, so watch time, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think watch time also inherently um, is kind of a more specific version of, of the binary um, you know, have I watched or not watched this item? Um, mm -hmm. It contains more information, and so we want to use the richest information possible. So if we're using this kind of watch time representation, then we want to use something that um, kind of respects this linear correlation from from the Pearson distance. Um, so we don't we don't necessarily we don't only want users to have watched the same thing. We want want them to have um, you know watched them for similar lengths of time. Um, I think. Uh, you know, if we don't think that, you know, watch time data or, or kind of the correlation between watch times is necessarily as predictive as simply comparing, you know, these binary watch indicators, then then we might want to use cosine similarity instead, um, mm -hmm. where we might even be able to use a combination of the two. Okay, cool. And um, since the unsupervised approach doesn't directly train on the watch time data, what kind of trade-offs does it make compared to the supervised system that you described earlier? Yeah, So so I think... Um, the unsupervised approach, the, the reason we kind of thought about it originally is that, um, it, you know, we had this data scarcity issue where we want to be able to, um, you know, train a personalized model or, or learn a personalized model for each user without having to, you know, 
train uh, a supervised model for each user, right? Uh, and so the great thing about these unsupervised methods is that you can get these personalized recommendations without the risk of overfitting since, since you're really just measuring similarity between all the users. Um, mm -hmm. It also means that you, um, you uh, are able to kind of add new users and new features and new items um, kind of for free uh, since you, you just have to get their embeddings and make sure you're keeping track of everything in a large database. Um, however, you know, compared to a supervised method, um, we do have to, it does mean that we have a lot more systems to build. So we have to build the data storage system. We have to build this kind of really large similarity search. Um, uh, one of the other issues is that we have this cold start issue. So with a supervised model, we can kind of regress to the mean and use kind of the most accurate model we have um, to kind of start as a base for, for building a prediction model for a given user. Um, but when, when we first kind of add a new item or add a new uh, uh, user to our database, um, it means that you know, there's nobody that's really similar to this user, or maybe the people that are most similar are the ones that kind of just started using the platform as well. And so um, we kind of have this issue where the, the results really only get good once the user has started watching a lot of um, movies. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So it kind of sounds like with um, the unsupervised approach or like augmenting the supervised approach, but it's unsupervised, you can get some extra accuracy, but perhaps at the cost of uh, a lot of like technical effort and storage, perhaps. Right. So I think, yeah, yeah. Um, there, there's a lot of these issues kind of, I think it depends on, on what we want to use. Um, and, and there's also, yeah. I think, a, an extra benefit to unsupervised over supervised, you know, Supervised might be the best way to go if we know that, you know, we really want to train a model only for watch time prediction. Um, but with this kind of similarity based approach, uh, we might be able to use this for, for other kinds of, of tasks as well. So for example, if, if say we wanted to, um, you know, uh, rather than kind of, you know, making a, a general watch time prediction, we might want to say, you know, given that a user has just watched this item. Uh, you know, uh, you know, after a user has finished watching something, what what kind of recommendations should we make for a user to watch next? Um, mm -hmm. And we, if with a supervised approach, we might have to kind of build an entirely new model to make this kind of conditional prediction uh, model or this conditional prediction task. Uh, with an unsupervised approach, we kind of uh, can solve a lot of these tasks um, with a little bit extra over with just a little bit extra overhead, uh, since we have a lot of these. Similarity metrics, we can measure similarity between users, which we were, which I discussed before, but we can also measure similarity between uh, items or users and items. Yeah, so that's a really good point that it's a very versatile approach that can also apply to other tasks as well. Um, so I'm curious then, do you think that there's a way to combine the best of both worlds when it comes to uh, supervised and unsupervised? Yeah, I think um, one, one simple way here is, is simply to, uh, you know, take into account the similarity and and learn um, like a very simple latent factor model. Um, so if we think about what our supervised model was doing before, right? We had um, some kind of general model that predicts a mean term, and then we learn some residuals. Uh, we might do something similar where we have, you know, a basic, really basic linear model that says, you know, we have some constant term plus a user term plus some item term, uh, where we kind of learn to regress the mean for each of these terms, and then we add an additional. Um, similarity term, um, similar to, to, to what we had before. Um, the issue here is that, uh, this, these, these kind of embeddings, um, it's difficult to, to know what features we might want to use. Uh, and so we can actually just simply learn them, uh, since we're, we have to learn all of the other factors as well. Cool. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so then I guess the last step is like, let's say you deploy this system, what kind of issue might it run into in production and how would you you know, modify your system to take these into account. Yeah, I think one of the biggest issues here is kind of the temporal changes that we might expect to see um, mm -hmm. during the deployment of our system. So, mm -hmm. for example, when, uh, you know, Netflix changes its UI or, you know, users see, um, you know, a single show recommended many times, um, you know, watch time predictions should should decrease accordingly. Um, and so, you know, for example, seasonality, you know, as, as we get into Christmas time, uh, you know, different shows get uh, become popular. And so we should we should increase our watch time predictions for those accordingly. Um, and so, you know, given this latent factor model, um, one of the ways to 
to integrate, you know, this time dependence is that we can simply um, model our latent func latent factors as a function of time. And so, you know, given given some certain time, we might predict, you know, a higher or lower mean for a given mm -hmm. item. Mm -hmm. um, I think we there's a, a few other things that we could add. So, for example, um, if we wanted to add an age or demographic information, um, we could also use um, kind of um, the similar latent factor framework where we um, we basically learn different kinds of features based on uh, whether a user is from a certain demographic uh, location. So we might have different factors for somebody from you know one region versus from another region. Um, and we, we might also be able to integrate um, you know social graph information as well by by weighting the similarity from from users uh, differently accordingly to whether they're connected in, in the graph. Okay, cool. You mentioned that there are some temporal effects involved, um, or like seasonality, perhaps that might make your model stale, for example. I'm wondering, uh, how would you decide when uh, you should like retrain or modify your model? That decision is is kind of difficult. Um, and so it would, it would really depend on kind of collecting a ton of uh, information as people start to, you know, uh, watch items. Um, we would want to collect a large uh, data set of kind of evaluation data and, and kind of continuously track the performance of our model. Um, of course, we, we would like to be able to, you know, update our model, um, you know, as, as time goes on. Um, but I think it's difficult here because we have, you know, these temporal effects that take place over um, long periods of time. Um, I think to decide when to retrain, um, we would want to observe whether there's kind of a really large shift and a large and consistent shift. So, you know, if our if our model suddenly dips during December and January, you know, but but kind of goes back to normal during February and March, then we might attribute this to, um, you know, being unable to really take into account um, temporal effects during the winter season, and we could mm -hmm. add this into our model. But you know, if it dips and then keeps keeps staying low and, and going down, then we might assume that something significant has changed in our user base, say um, some kind of UI change or some kind of, um, you know, significant change in, in who's who's actually on um, the platform. That would mean that we might need to recollect data and retrain. Okay, perfect. Uh, I think this is a great place for us to pause. You did an amazing job. Uh, so I'm curious to hear from you what you saw at this interview. Uh, what do you think went well and what do you think you would change? Yeah, I think I think in general it went well um, in in kind of describing the systems that we we wanted to look at. So um, I said I thought that the the description of kind of the the supervised and unsupervised systems were relatively fleshed out. Um, I do think that there were a few um, complexities in the kind of feature representation and you know building these really large metrics uh, matrices for doing similarity over that. I think got a little bit lost, um, especially once we got to kind of the latent factor models. I think um, there's there's a lot of nuance that that's kind of difficult to describe here with with such a mm -hmm. such a difficult problem. Yeah, um, I agree with a lot of those points, but I wanted to start out by saying I thought you did uh, a re a really fantastic job of utilizing all of the different sources of data because it can be very tempting to just say, okay, I have watch time data, I can just train the model because I have these labels available and just call it a day. Um, but it's cool that you were able to consider the fact that uh, with personalized uh, embeddings or models, um, some of the data might be scarce, especially for a new year. So, so it can be helpful to incorporate like unsupervised methods and a combination of those two can be really powerful. So I definitely appreciate that. I also thought you did a great job of like justifying a lot of your decisions of mentioning both the pros and the cons of, you know, adding an unsupervised approach, for example. And as you mentioned, uh, there were maybe a couple of details that could be fleshed out more. Uh, so, for example, uh, what one detail I was wondering about is um, you mentioned that you wanted to use one hot feature factors uh, for the supervised approach. Um, so I was wondering, like, uh, what are some of the issues that might come up with one hot feature vectors? Yeah, so with, with the one hot feature vectors, uh, I think I mentioned that there, there's a lot of issues with, with overfitting, and we also have issues where um, our, our features can get really large. So... If we have, say, you know, a library of a hundred thousand actors, um, that means that our our feature vector then grows to 
um, is additionally, you know, 100,000 extra dimensions that we need to fit. Um, yeah. And it means that, you know, if we have, you know, one one specific actor that's present in a few things that that the model might pick up on this as, as an errant signal that we should predict some some very high watch times. Um, but but maybe they're only like a background character or something in a very mm-hmm. popular TV show. Um, I think one one simple issue, uh, one simple option to fix this would be kind of restricting it to um, kind of like a top K. So say, um, rather than trying to model a feature vector for all top 100,000 or all 100,000 actors, we might say pick the top 10,000 and only have a feature mm-hmm. vector for, for these 10,000 actors. Um, mm-hmm. But I think ideally we would want some kind of, um, you know, embedding space where we can have an embedding for for an actor or um, for a movie, for example, that that we can measure similarity over, um, and this would kind of necessitate a similar kind of latent factor approach where we're we're modeling um, actors as as these kind of embeddings. Um, but I think there's there's a lot of different kind of ways that we could learn um, an embedding space that would be useful for making these kind of predictions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's really smart, especially on uh, the data size on the one hot feature vectors perhaps getting very, very large. Um, yeah, so also related to uh, the way that we featureize the data, you mentioned before, or we talked about this before, that we have the user's watch time history as um, other data that can be used. How would you featureize this information? Yeah, I think for for a supervised approach, it's it's a little difficult um, to, to be able to featureize this since, mm-hmm. you know, uh, we, we can't simply add on another feature vector that says, you know, this is what uh, this user watched previously. Um, I think one, one way to do this uh, is kind of to train some kind of encoder that takes the user's watch history or, um, and produces, you know, integrates this into the user embedding that we might learn. Um, but of course, I think it's difficult for a supervised model to take this into approach. Um, I think that the easiest way here would would simply be to integrate it into the model itself in the way that I described mm-hmm. where we kind of train a general model that regresses to the mean and then we learn a kind of user specific model that learns kind of the residual or or user specific preferences that are different from kind of your average user um, um although you you kind of get this for for free during your um uh during your um, kind of similarity based metrics because we're inherently using a user's watch history in order to right. kind of find similar uh, other users. Um, and so right, when, exactly. if we, if we were to build kind of supervised embeddings, we might hope that uh, we have something similar. Yeah. Okay. That makes a lot of sense to me. All right. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Nathan. Thank you for uh, having me. Yeah. Please come back. All right. Thanks everybody for watching. Bye everyone. Thanks. <laughs>